Okay, let's open our Bibles to the book of Ezra once again. Ezra chapter 5. We looked at the first five verse, excuse me, first five verses last time. And uh, there's correspondence going on back and forth between the king of Persia and the enemies of the Jews, those who would like to stop their building program, building, rebuilding the temple and uh, rebuilding the city <coughs> that had been destroyed when Nebuchadnezzar took them captives and, and made them exiles in Babylon 70 years earlier. And uh, let's read verses 6 through 10 of chapter 5. The copy of the letter that Tatnai, governor on this side of the river, and Shethar Boznai and his companions, the Epharsic fights, excuse me, let me repronounce that, of Epharsicites, which were on this side of the river, sent unto Darius the king. They sent a letter unto him, wherein was written thus, Unto Darius the king, all peace. Be it known unto the king that we went into the province of Judea to the house of the great God, which is built with great stones and timbers laid in the walls, and this work goeth fast on and prosper in their hands. Then asked we those elders, and said unto them, uh, Thus, who commanded you to build this house and to make up these walls? We asked their names also to certify thee that we might write the names of the men that were the chief of them. The expression found twice in verse 6, this side the river, uh, applies to the governor Tatnai and to his companions, the, the uh, territorial rulers of the Persian Empire. Uh, another word used to describe them, governors and so forth, was satraps. I think I mentioned that last time. Notice how much, I want you to notice how much truth is revealed in this attack against the Jews, against Israel against the Bible, against the Holy Spirit. The antagonists of the Jews uh, make it sound like they were only inquiring about the Jews' actions. Uh, but the truth is they were wanting to get the, them arrested for rebuilding this temple, for continuing their work, and uh, executed if possible. The world hates a real Bible-believing Christian. If he ever opens his mouth and says something contrary to what an uh, unsaved worldly man wants to believe. People have clever and creative ways of rationalizing and justifying their sin and their action, and they don't want anyone calling them uh, to account for it or exposing it. And things of that kind have never changed. Human nature is always the same when it comes to those types of things. But uh, they say, um, their letter says, Unto Darius the king, all peace, quote, uh, the house of the great God, and then later, quote, it prospered in their hands. It sounds like they were very kind and genteel and, and nice and pleasant towards the Jews, making simply in inquiry and harmless, benign questions about what they were doing. But, uh, they don't mean any harm to anyone, but just like the federal and state and local or county workers who simply want to monitor what your church is doing. Do you have enough fire extinguishers? Do you have enough handicapped restrooms? Do you have enough exits, exit doors for every 100 people in your building and so forth? Uh, that, is, that is the government poking its nose into the, businesses, the business of the church where it shouldn't be. And um, so the scenarios, or the, the, the players may be different from era to era, but the scenario is roughly the same. A few years ago, um, some Republican congressman, which disgusts me, because I'm a Republican, but uh, I forget the name of the, the, the senator, he launched an investigation into some of these mega church. Uh, pastors, the ones you see on television, Benny Hinn and Creflo Dollar and Kenneth Copeland. 
some of these guys who are raking in millions of dollars, living lavish uh, and uh, opulent lifestyles, but are paying no federal taxes because they're a 501c3 uh, designation with the IRS as a church, as a ministry. And uh, they want to investigate them and why does this pastor need a new $25 million private jet? That's a good question. Uh, why does any pastor need his own private jet? But, uh, you know, and you've heard those stories, and you've maybe seen some of the, the documentaries that they've produced about the lavish lifestyles of some of these ministries. Uh, you can pray that God will upset those ministries. You can pray that people will wake up to what they're doing and stop giving money to them. You can pray that they might be exposed as frauds, which they are. But for goodness sake, don't call the government to put their nose in and get themselves involved. Because the way these things would go is if the government passed a law to start regulating or reining in these high dollar ministries, you know good and well they won't stop there. Somehow it'll trickle down to smaller churches and everybody suffers. So you want the government involved in your life as little as possible. And I think it's, it's your right to want to pay as little tax to the government as possible, as necessary. Find as many deductions as you can find and uh, pay as little as you have to pay. Um, I think a smaller government is best for everyone concerned. Uh, seems like the government is the, well, the, the federal government is the largest employer in the country. The largest em employer is not Walmart, it's not anything, it's the, it's the, it's the federal government. And uh, they've been growing their employment staff by leaps and bounds in the last decade or so. So that everybody's working for the government and expecting the, the rest of the country, the private citizen, the taxpayer, to pay for their pensions, pay for their retirement, pay, pay for their union. Why should government employees have unions and demand things that the private citizen is unable to demand and have protections that the private citizen doesn't have. If a guy is incompetent because he belongs, but, but because he belongs to the union, uh, the post office or whatever agent, they can't fire him. But in, in real life, in the real world, working world, a private employer would say, I can't use you anymore, you get out, I replace you with somebody else. But, so he wants little, uh, Contact with bureaucrats as you have to have. Anyway, um, these churches aren't paying uh, tax dollars. And that's the issue. Money seems to always be the thing the federal tax, uh, federal uh, government is interested in. But the Jews' enemies were upset about the Jews' response which follows here in verses 11 through 17. Here's part of the letter. And thus they return and us answer, saying, We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth, and build the house that was built these many years ago, which a great king of Israel builded and set up. That would be King Solomon. But after that our fathers had provoked the God of heaven unto wrath, he gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed this house and carried the people away into Babylon. But in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Babylon, the same king Cyrus made a decree to build this house of God, and the vessels also of gold and silver of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took out of the temple that was in Jerusalem and brought them into the temple of Babylon. Those did Cyrus the king take out of the temple of Babylon, and they were delivered unto one whose name was Sheshbazar, whom he had made governor, and said unto him, Take these vessels, go carry them into the temple that is in Jerusalem. Let the house of God be builded in his place. Then came the same Sheshbazar, and laid the foundation in the house of God, of the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, and since that time, even until now, hath it been in building, and yet it is not finished. Now therefore, if it seemed good to the king, let there be search made in the king's treasure house, which is there at Babylon, whether it be so, that a decree was made of Cyrus the king to build this house of God at Jerusalem, 
and let the king send his pleasure to us concerning this matter. Notice the peculiar title given to Cyrus, king of Persia, verse 13. There he's called the king of Babylon. And the reason for this is because this was when Cyrus assumed control of Babylon, um, verse 13, and the Jews who were exiles in Babylon and then returned to Jerusalem uh, under Cyrus' decree would naturally compare him with the king who first took them captives. So Cyrus was the successor of Nebuchadnezzar. But I want you to go to Daniel chapter, keep your finger here, go to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel 6, notice there verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom an hundred and twenty princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And verse also verse 25. Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell on all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. Look back to chapter 5. Chapter 5 and... Here's the writing on the wall that's on the hand. Verse 28, Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. And then verses 30 and 31, In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain, and Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. So Belshazzar, who came after Nebuchadnezzar, uh, has a big party, and he uses the... the uh, instruments or the vessels uh, from the Jews' temple to have a, to a drink wine with all of his guests <coughs> and not regard the, um, the prudence and the caution that Nebuchadnezzar had learned to, uh, to exercise once he had been deposed. Remember, he was driven to the, out in the wilderness and lived like an animal until his sanity came back to him and is restored to his, his uh, throne once again. But um, Darius uh, was now king over Babylon, etc., and, and all of Babylon's territories before Cyrus came along. In our text, it sounds like King Cyrus had preceded Darius, uh, the king, in, in this letter. Yet, in the book of Daniel, Darius seems to have preceded Cyrus. And that bothered me for a while. I had to do a little research. And the truth is, there were actually two kings named Darius. There was Darius the Mede, the Medians, the Media Empire, the one mentioned there in Daniel. And then there was Darius the Persian, the one uh, referred to in our text. And he's also sometimes called Darius the Great in history. Also, I want you to notice some, a few things. The last king of Babylon, which will be found in Revelation chapter 13, and also Revelation 17, the last king of Babylon is typified by the first king of Babylon, back in Genesis 10.10, 10, that would be Nimrod. I recall how Nimrod united the world, and um, they're all one language, and then God d divided all their languages. Everyone went off in different directions, because that sort of unity, the uni unity of mankind and, and the human race, uh, without without God's direction, is devilish and satanic, and God won't have it. And that's why the United Nations is going to be destroyed someday, because they, they want to unite the world without God and without the Word of God. And that, thus will it be with the, the Antichrist, the man of sin, who wants the world to unite around him, and not the Lord God of the Bible. And the last king... The future Antichrist is also prefigured by Nebuchadnezzar in several places in the book of Daniel. 
his idolatry, um, the measurement of his image, uh, his desire for universal worship, his anti-Semitism, his pride, um, his power, his location, and the kinds of music that accompanied him. In Daniel 3, 5, he lists six kinds of instruments to be played. Um, you recall back in the book of Exodus, I think Exodus 32, when Moses and Aaron are up on the mountain receiving the laws of God, and they come back down a hill, and by this time he'd been gone 40 days and 40 nights, uh, and, and the, the children of Israel have grown impatient. They demand that, that uh, Joshua make them an image that they can worship, because we don't know what happened to Moses. And so Joshua complies, and they, build, they make this golden calf, and the people are dancing around it, and they're coming down the hill with the, with the laws of God, and Joshua says, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a noise of war in the camp, it's a noise of music. It's not the music of some being overcome, but the music of, of uh, some conquering, but the noise of but the sound of music I hear. And that kind of music uh, had stimulated the people to dance, and some of them were naked, dancing around the idol that Joshua, or that rather, that, uh, Aaron. that Aaron had uh, allowed them to make, or helped them to make. And uh, so music is not amoral. Some music is what you, you and I might call spiritual music. That it, it uplifts the spirit. It doesn't have to be a hymn. It doesn't even have to have gospel words to it. But I like listening to KUSC in my car. It's about the only classical station around that I'm aware of. And um, it really calms you down. They, you know, all these rock and roll stations, they have their music at 5 o'clock, uh, right as you're getting into your car, driving home, fighting traffic. And it's anything but calming or soothing. <laughs> Uh, but KUSC in their classical uh, music uh, format uh, actually does. I like listening to it on the way to work, on the way back from work, when I'm just driving around. And uh, But the, the man of sin, the Antichrist, he will certainly follow the patterns laid out before him. He had different types of the uh, Antichrist found in the scriptures. Let me offer some additional things to consider. Solomon, the son of David, is one of the greatest types of Christ in the Bible. His reign and his temple foreshadow Christ's millennial reign in his thousand-year kingdom. But he's also marked out as a type of the Antichrist. It says in 2 Chronicles 9.13, Now the weight of the gold that came to Solomon in one year was six hundred, three score, and six talents, six, six, six. Also, that's repeated in 1 Kings 10, verse 14. Solomon also turned away from God. 1 Kings 11, verse 56 says, For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. 1 Kings 11, verses 5 and 6. Excuse me. The king of Persia, who is mentioned in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, matches one of Satan's seven heads. I think we touched on this briefly on Sunday when I was trying to answer a lady's question. Uh, mentioned in Revelation 12. The other six being, the other six kings of history being these. Nimrod, the first king of Babel, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and these are world leaders, the preeminent leader of, uh, of the world over all other kingdoms in their respective times. Sennacherib, who was the king of Assyria, also mentioned in the Bible. Then Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon again. And Alexander the Great, from the Empire of Greece, the only one whose name is not actually mentioned in the scriptures. And then Caesar, 
the emperor of Roman Empire, the the known the the ruling power of the entire world uh, in its day, and um, a total of seven in total, seven world rulers in their respective times, who all, who all pictured the future man of sin in some way or another, either they're the, they're the desire for worship of themselves, their desire to persecute the Jew, uh, and a number of other particulars you could probably identify. Uh, and this world ruler, who typifies the Antichrist, befriends the Jew for a time. Um, let me have you run to Isaiah 44. Isaiah 44, and one verse there, the last verse, verse 28, or God, he's, the writer is writing about God, verse 28, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. And Cyrus, or Cyrus the Great, certainly did that. Nebuchadnezzar, one of the greatest forerunners of the Antichrist, converts to Judaism in, in a manner of speaking. Look at Daniel chapter 4. After invading Israel and taking multitudes of Jews to uh, the kingdom of Babylon as servants or captives, uh, he encounters something that forced him to recognize the God of Israel. Daniel 4 and verses 34 and 35. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand, or say unto him, what doest thou? And um, what are all these verses <clears throat> trying to indicate to the Bible reader, the Bible believer? And they're showing us that the man of sin will go along with Israel for a period of time. And then he will break uh, his covenant with them. Um, we'll go to Daniel 11. For just a moment, and then we'll be done for tonight. Daniel 11. Daniel 11, um, verse 23. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. And verses 31, 32. And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly, wickedly excuse me, against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Some Jews will be taken in by the man of sin. Um, and others will not. They'll recognize this as the abomination warned about by the prophet Daniel, and uh, perhaps warned about even by their rabbis. Uh, and they'll, uh, they'll flee. Those will be the ones that, that the Antichrist sets out to attack and to uh, hunt down. The ones who think uh, they can worship him, they'll be hunted down too, but that they're, that because of their own foolishness in believing the man of sin. And I... I think I've touched on this 
uh, on Sunday, that somewhere in that time frame, the man of sin, uh, reigning from the city of Rome, Italy, becomes the, the son of perdition and begins to reign or, or rule and demand worship from the city of Jerusalem. And somewhere in between that, those events, uh, someone tries to attack him. Someone wounds him, nigh unto death. His right arm is come, cut off and dried up. His eye, right eye is dried up. And um, everyone thinks he's dead. He makes a miraculous recovery. He's either killed and then comes back to life, or he's close enough to death that everyone writes him off, but he recovers miraculously, miraculously and then demands worship uh, as God in the flesh. And, um, and it says in Revelation 17, about verse 9, that he is the eighth, but is of the seven. And the seventh kingdom, Rome, in that list, never really disappeared. As I mentioned on Sunday, it sort of metamorphosed into the Roman Catholic Empire, with the rise of the Pope and the papacy, College of Cardinals and the Catholic Church, and uh, they they thought they would they would headquarter their religion in Rome, since that was the capital of the world at the time, and uh, model their religion largely after the political uh, model of the Caesars and the Roman Empire, and so they call themselves Catholic Roman Catholic Rome. That's where they're headquarters is, but Catholic meaning universal. So they assume, they assume, they presume authority over every church, every pastor in the world. Not just the Catholic priests, they really believe that their Pope uh, is the supreme authority over all professing Christian religions in the world. And everyone needs to unite under his authority. So in a sense, the, the Empire of Rome never fully disappeared, and it's been shape-shifting from decade to decade and century to century, and whatever country it needed to go in and survive, until it now meddles in the political affairs of just about every other government in the world. Rome has their representative at the United Nations as well, called the, um, uh, the papal emissary, or the, the papal representative. And uh, they're not simply a religion, they are a government. And they are a worldwide government. They have a branch office in every neighborhood, if you look at it that way. 